You are listening to the We Are Cousins podcast, a podcast that focuses in South Texas and Northeastern Mexico genealogy. Thank you all for tuning in. Today we have uh, Dave Gutierrez with us and also Wellester Alvarado. Dave is the author of the book uh, Patriots from the Barrio. And today we're going to talk about his book about military research and also we're going to talk about his uh, future book or the book that he's working on. And with nothing else, let's get started. But before we get started, I want to thank Las Vías del Norte for sponsoring this episode. Las Vías del Norte Genealogy Group helps you find your ancestors by providing you with online presentations, how-to videos, and publications so you can leave a legacy for your children and their children. Make sure and visit them at lasviasdelnorte.com. Once again, that is lasviasdelnorte.com. And now to our conversation. Thank you all for joining us today for the We're Cousins podcast. And today we're delighted to have uh, Dave Gutierrez with us. And he's the hey. author of Patriots from the Barrio. We also have Wellester Alvarado with us as uh, we do every month. And we will be talking about his book, uh, some military research, uh, especially for Texas for those of you that have Tejano ancestors. And also uh, we'll be talking about his uh, future pres uh, participation for the We Are Cousins Conference that's coming up uh, this September the 15th through the 17th. And with nothing else, I'll let uh, Dave Gutierrez introduce himself and tell us a little bit more about who he is and what he is about. <laughs> Awesome. Well, first of all, Moises, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, love everything that you're doing uh, for genealogy out there. Uh, so I'm always, I'm always uh, willing to help and, and excited all the time to be a part of your, your presentations and podcasts. So thank, thanks again. Uh, my name is Dave Gutierrez. I'm the writer and the author of the book, Patriots from the Barrio. It's the true story of the only all Mexican-American U.S. Army unit in World War II. Now, I had a relative who served in World War II, and as a child, uh, I heard all his stories about growing up uh, and how our relative served in the U.S. Army in World War II, captured twice by the German Army, escaped both times, making it back across Allied lines, became one of only a few Americans to be decorated for valor on the battlefield by the Soviet Union wow. during World War II. So knowing all of this, uh, I got heavily into genealogy research. I, in 2008, I discovered this new website called Ancestry.com. <laughs> and I got to tell you, my life has never been the same since. Um, you know, I'd find myself up at two in the morning uh, staring at U.S. Census records, uh, That's right. <laughs> realizing, hey, you have to go back to, you have to go to work in about four hours. <laughs> but um Genealogy research really kickstarted for me this project about telling the story of my primo Ramon Gutierrez from Del Rio, Texas, uh, who has served in the, Ar in the U.S. Army. And through research, I realized that, you know, Ramon had, had, had served in very unique and historical U.S. Army unit uh, in the fact that they were all of Mexican-American descent the only such unit in, in World War II. So in 2014, I self-published the book. In 2018, it was picked up by West Home Publishing and that's the, the photo that you see behind me is the, uh, the poster of the cover. I am the president of the Nuevo Mundo Historical and Genealogical Society here in Silicon Valley. And uh, that's Dave Gutierrez in a nutshell, right? <laughs> I, pretty, I, I pretty stay busy with all that. Um, you know what? It, it sounds like uh, in words, like not much, but in, in action and things that you've done and accomplished, it's a lot. That's a lot that, uh, that you've accomplished up to, up to date. And I know there's much more to come. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We're staying busy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. And I wanted to ask you, Dave, uh, earlier today you were telling us about uh, being featured on a popular uh, U.S. network, television network. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Yeah, so um, recently I did a presentation for the National World War II Museum. Now, for me, that was groundbreaking. We had, we were talking about, and not only did they say, hey, Dave, uh, 
we want you to be a part of this international conference and talk a little bit about, no, they featured our presentation as Hispanic Americans in World War II. So to me, that was groundbreaking because we've been waiting for that for decades to tell our stories of Hispanic American contributions in World War II. So I did, I did a presentation for the National World War II Museum's International Conference in March. And just yesterday, and I guess, I guess uh, I'll say on April 18th on Sunday, uh, it aired on C-SPAN. C-SPAN television picked it up. Uh, and it will air again uh, this upcoming Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern on C-SPAN 3. Uh, so that'll be April 25th. I believe, uh, this Sunday. Excellent. That is amazing. And, um, you know, a lot of contributions by Hispanic uh, Americans, not just Mexican Americans, have always been underplayed. And uh, one we're, example- We're phantoms. We're phantoms. You know, one example is that movie that John Wayne did about Water Canal, where this- uh, he was a Hispanic. He he got uh, over a thousand five hundred uh, Japanese to surrender, right. but then in that movie, guess what? He was not played by a Hispanic. He was played uh, by an Anglo. Right, and and, and the, the the and I I've been a big World War II buff even as a kid, and my dad would have me sit down and watch these movies. And the movie you're talking about is From Hell to Eternity, uh, with Jeffrey Hunter right. playing. Uh, Guy Galbadon from East LA. Guy Galbadon grew up in, you know, in East LA and he was, became a U, uh, U.S. Marine. Uh, he was actually sort of adopted by a Japanese American family. <laughs> and then World War II breaks out and that family gets interned in the camps. Uh, Guy Galbadon goes on to become a U.S. Marine and because he was a, around the Japanese a family so much, he learned to speak Japanese. So as a Marine on, on, on the Pacific Islands, he actually helped capture thousands of Japanese, uh, convincing them to surrender uh, by speaking their native tongue, uh, tongue. But again, yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, Jeffrey Hunter, plays Guy Galbadon. Here we have Jeffrey Hunter, a blonde, blue-eyed <laughs> guy, and nowhere in the film do you hear or see that Guy Galbadon is a Mexican-American from East LA. Not even Hispanic, period, not that, from, quite, you know, anywhere. Right. And you know, what I heard was that uh, they actually hired him to be a, an advisor when they were making the movie. Right. But uh, I guess they had to appeal to the demographics for the that time period, I guess, to be able to. It's true, because in those days, they, they were just uh, Mexicans were uh, white, white uh, clothing with huarachis and, and a sombrero. That was it. Walking around with a burro. That's, that's and, it. And since we're on the subject here and talking about a little bit about Hollywood and how they're portrayed in this. I first wrote the book, uh, Patriots from the Barrio, in 2014. I self-published it. In 2017, Hollywood actor-producer Wilmer Valderrama. Right, I saw that. <clears throat> read an article that I wrote because I, I specifically wanted to feature my Primo Ramon and, and the Rapido River crossing that they did in, in Italy during World War II. Well, Wilmer reads this article and he goes back and he has, Wilmer has his own production company. And the way Wilmer tells me, he goes, Dave, I, I read your article and I couldn't put my, I grabbed a cup of coffee and I never even touched my coffee until I read your, until I read your entire article. And he goes, the next day I went back to my production staff. I said, I need you all to read this article. Let's find the book. Let's read the book and then find me that writer. And in 2017, Wilmer Valderrama's production team uh, obtained the film rights to the book, Patriots from the Barrio. And now CBS TV Studios is on board and they're looking to produce a television series based on the book. Wow. And one of the first things that I told Wilmer is that story of Guy Galbadon, Hell to Eternity and Jeffrey Hunter playing. I, and I 
specifically told Wilmer, that is my biggest fear, is to sign over this thing to someone who's going to take it and sort of turn it around. And I, I basically told him, uh, you know, I can't have Ben Affleck playing my, 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 my cousin Ramon in, in this. And he assured me that that was not going to happen with Patriots from the Barrio, that this was going to be an all Latino cast uh, to portray Latinos. That's amazing. Can't wait for it. Me either. <clears throat> and, you know, it's great that it's getting more, it's getting noticed more. And I know you've been pr promoting it real good. Um, you know, um, now let's talk a little bit about genealogy because I know that's the main focus of our um, sure. podcast. You know, could you tell us about the websites or tools or resources that you use to find these documents? I know we have a lot of listeners out there mm -hmm. that their grandparents fought in World War II, their uncles, their great uncles. There's a lot of people you know, here in Monterey. In my, here in Monterey that went over, fought, and then they came back and uh, they're like, like I said, they're phantoms. When I meet them here, I look at them and I go, what? Your, your, your grandfather or your father or your, there's a lot of people here in Monterey. We're, we're almost or, or two hours from the border. So it was a daily routine going back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's talk, uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, again, in 2008, I discovered the website Ancestry.com. Mm. And uh, uh, on Ancestry, you can message people back and forth. And uh, as I was going through Ancestry and, you know, kind of teaching myself how to, how to, how to do research and, and things like that, uh, I kept running across newspaper articles about my cousin Ramon. Uh, wow. and, the, and I started to learn even more about his, his service. And then on Ancestry, you could message people back and forth. And I noticed that someone was saving the exact same uh, documents that I was. The same birth records, the same death records. I go, man, this person has to be related to me. Uh, so I messaged them and I said, by any chance, are, are, are you related to the Gutierrez family from Del Rio, Texas? She messaged me back right away and says, yes, <clears throat> my mother was born in Del Rio. And it happens that her mother, my cousin Gloria's mother, is Ramon's sister. Wow. <laughs> and she lived here in San Jose. I, I'm from San Jose, California. She lives here in San Jose. She goes, I live in San Jose. I said, I live in San Jose. Wait. Um, she's so, your neighbor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we got to talking and I quickly asked my parents, hey, do you know anybody who, who, who's, whose name uh, this? And they go, yeah, es tu prima, hombre? <laughs> uh. And she basically told me who she was and, um, and how we're related. So she goes, you know, my mom wants to meet you. Why don't you come over for dinner? And we did. And obviously, whenever the family gets together, and this is like this in all our history, we talk about that one person in the family, right? That everybody talks about. I mean, for whatever reason, the name always comes up. Either they did something spectacular or in the family. So whenever the family gets together, Ramon's name always came up because, you know, he, this guy's a, a highly decorated World War II veteran. A hero. Yeah, and here I here we are, I'm talking to his sister in, in, in her kitchen table. Well, I left their house that day and I'm like, wow, how come nobody's ever put this man's story together? <clears throat> and uh, and that's, that's what started it for me. So I started to do more research on Ramon. And as I started to get more information about the soldiers, I got a roster of the entire unit. I found a roster that had names and addresses wow. of all of the soldiers, like their, their next of kin. Now, to a genealogist or somebody working gene, that's a gold mine. Yes, sir. Because here you have in 1940 where they were living. So, boy, the U.S. Census record came in very handy. So I would grab one soldier and I would look for the U.S. Census record that would match that address. And bingo, I have, I have made a match. 
Well, through the, it took me five years to write the book, uh, through, to, to do the research in writing the book. And through the five years, I connected with over 60 different families of the men that served with my cousin Ramon in World War II. Using can, I ask you, can I ask you a question? Yes. Of, of, of those 60 people, I saw a photo of the battalion, the 141st, I think it is. Yes. <clears throat> but they looked like there were more than 60 there. Yeah, there's 250 wow. men in that photo. And that is the entire company of Company E in the 141st. Wow. And for the listeners out there, uh, this unit was an original Texas National Guard unit out of El Paso, Texas. Wow. There were two National Guard units in El Paso. Company H, completely Anglo. Company E was a segregated all Mexicans from, from El Segundo Barrio and the Barrios of El Paso, Texas. But I noticed that the uh, first lieutenant um, was a, a, a Gwyn. Uh, it wasn't a Mexican or a Hispanic at all. All of the officers were Anglo. And I noticed that the, that the highest ranking Mexican was a, a, a sergeant first class or uh, I forget the, the the it's the one with the stripe underneath the stripes. The it was chevron. a master sergeant. He was a master, master sergeant. sergeant. That's as high as I saw anyone. Yeah, yeah. They were all all of them uh, consisted of all Mexicanos from the from the barrios of El Paso. And when they were federalized in 1940, uh, the unit moved to Camp Bowie in Brownwood, Texas, and they actually pulled out the 30. They were part of the 36 Infantry Division. And when they all gathered at Camp Bowie in Brownwood, Texas, they actually pulled out more Mexicans from like places, the, the National Guard units of San Antonio, uh, Austin, Dallas areas, and they actually put them in Company E. Well, by doing that, uh, they actually pulled out veterans who had already been in the National Guard unit. So these guys really stood out in training and on the battlefield when they went out and fought. Um, they were the honor company of 2nd Battalion and the 141st. They rarely came in second in any of the testing and training that they did. They were usually first. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that almost all the other pilots were all lieutenants. Yes. I never, I never heard of any pilot that was a sergeant. They were all <laughs> lieutenants. Yeah, all the officers, uh, and we can get into pilots in a little bit when I talk a little bit about my second book coming out. Um, but uh, let's get getting back to genealogy. Um, I used a lot of military records um, in order to locate the families. And for what for one instance, um, there was one soldier who was really. Uh, becoming a unicorn. I couldn't find his family anywhere. And what really opened up the, the brick wall to that uh, in, in finding his family was the tombstone record the, that the family had ordered for the, for the soldier, for their, for their relative who had served in Company E. Now this soldier had been killed in action in Italy. And in 1948, the government told all of the, the family members who had lost relatives overseas and were still buried overseas that they would, they would give them the option of either they could lay rested where they fell, like if, if he, they were killed in Italy, they would stay in Italy, or they could bring back their, their loved one and the US government would make sure that that would happen. And they brought back uh, Gilberto Garza who, had been from, who was from Laredo, wow. uh, who was, who was killed in action in Italy. And uh, it was the tombstone record that actually opened things up for me to find his family because his sister had ordered the, the, the tombstone and her signature was on it. I had her name and that propelled me to, to find the family. Um, I know you talked about ancestry and how useful it was. And I always tell people it's very important to network with other uh, people. And that's the purpose of the We're Cousins Facebook group. 
you could go and network. Doesn't matter the level that you are. If you're a beginner, if you're just only interested, or if you're an intermediate or advanced with your research skills, you could always go there and ask for help and network, and you kind of find cousins because everybody in that group we're related eight to five generations back. We're, we're all related. Yeah. You know, um, I know. And you're well, and I'm going to mention this. Dave Gutierrez was uh, one of our presenters for the first We're Cousins uh, conference last year in September. And right. he had a presentation about his book and how he used genealogy to find all those stories, all those documents. And something that I was very surprised was like, when I saw the, the, the Dave's book, I'm like, how could he write so much about one person? Well, guess what? Those documents contain the wealth of information. Yeah. And that's something I came to find out. And I know you mentioned, um, was it the National Archives or was it another website that actually gave you access to to those documents? Uh, the National Archives is, is very helpful um, because you can find all kinds of uh, information on, on, uh, on veterans. Uh, you can actually order uh, veterans... Uh, papers uh, from from the military. And in my next presentation for you on, on in the We Are Cousins upcoming conference, I will be- a spoiler alert. I'm sorry, yes, yeah, a spoiler alert. Uh, I will be detailing uh, how I ordered my cousin Ramon's uh, records. Now I had some records and family members as I reached out to family all his grandchildren who were very helpful in ha having me put his story together. Uh, some of them had, had a few of his military records, but I wanted to see everything that, that was available to me. And uh, I went ahead and ordered them through the National Archives. And it's a form that you fill out. It's like a two, two, three page form that you fill out. I think you pay like 20, 25 bucks. Uh, the one thing with, with those forms is you have to cross your fingers and hope that they survived the huge fire that they had in the 70s oh, because wow. the National Archives lost so many records. And, and some of my primo's uh, records, you could actually see burn marks on, on some of the papers, but it survived. Wow. And uh, there was a lot of information in there. It, it tells you, like his draft record will tell you where they were living. Uh, you know, the draft notice that, that you could find on, on, on Ancestry and on Family Search and things like that. Uh, but his actual military records gave me detailed information about where the unit was, where, where he was uh, wounded, what days he was wounded, um, his discharge date, things like that. Um, but those are always very helpful because it gives you addresses and things like that of where he was living at the time. That sounds great. You know, and uh, something I've noticed, and I recently watched uh, Band of Brothers, mm -hmm. and something that stood out was like, we need that report, write that report, telling the, the main guys. Mm -hmm. So it just shows us that for every military action they did or any little campaign, they had to write a report and it included the names of who participated, who got wounded, who got killed. And everything will go back to, I guess, a centralized place. And eventually everything ended up in the National Archives. So if you had an ancestor that participated in World War II, doesn't matter what he did there, um, or if they saw action or not, I always search with the National Archives because mm -hmm. they do have a file and I'm really looking forward to your presentation so we could learn more about uh, researching military records same here yeah yeah so um you you were talking about the unit uh reports that the officers those were so helpful in, in to me writing the book so I had the personal stories when I reached out to the ancestors right I found the family members and most of the time I either found the the, the children of the veteran or the, even the grandchildren. Uh, Cause I would sometimes, the grandchildren are on social media, right? I could find them easily, but I had to do 
genealogy research of the entire soldier, uh, right? So I had to, the so, one soldier, how many children did he have? What children wow. did he have? And six. Then, yeah, yeah, most of them had six <laughs> to eight kids. So I started doing, and you know, you'd find one, one of the children and maybe they weren't, didn't want to talk to you about this or what. You had to find that one person in the family that was willing to talk to you and say, yeah, I would love for you to honor my father or my grandfather this way. Uh, but those, uh, Moises was just talking about the unit uh, reports. Uh, so I had the individual family uh, uh, stories of the soldier. But what really opened things up for me was when I found the entire units after action reports. So I got together with the Texas Military Forces Museum in Austin, Texas. And there's a person there that works there, Lisa Sherrick, who was absolutely wonderful in helping me gather up everything about Company E. And uh, she supplied me with the after action reports, the day-to-day -day reports of wow. the officers. And when they went on patrol, it would name all of the soldiers. And I go, I would be looking there and be, hey, there's my primo Ramon. <laughs> and they would talk about how he was awarded the Silver Star and why he was awarded the Silver Star when they landed at Salerno, Italy. This, my primo goes and charges a machine gun nest and kills three German soldiers and the last one in hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's heroic action. In order to open up the beachhead because they were almost pushed off the beach. They wow. ran into five enemy tanks and a machine gun nest and my primo goes and charges this machine gun nest. He gets wounded. The rifle is knocked out of his hands. And he still charges the machine gun nest without a rifle, silences it with a, a hand grenade. Wow. <laughs> I mean, this is, I mean, we've known this as a kid, but again, we wanted to make sure that story got out there. But yeah, Moises, uh, the, hearsay. you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the after action reports. And uh, during my um, presentation at your next conference, I'm gonna show uh, your audience how they can find those types of, of uh, reports, the day-to-day -day reports that their veteran may have served in, in a certain unit. I wanna um, find my uncle Joe, he was in World War II and, and uh, there's no information that verbally or th that we know of in in print so this is going to be great for us thank you well sir, have you tried getting his uh record service uh no from the, well that oh so then the presentation is going to be great so you're going to learn how to do that yes yep. absolutely <laughs> i haven't done it because i don't know how so that where to start or anything yeah dave yeah. could you try the your book sure um so if anybody's interested in uh, reading this awesome uh, book, it's Patriots from the Barrio, and I think it's available on Amazon. Yes. So just go to Amazon. If you have the Prime, you get it in two days. It's also in Amazon Mexico. Uh, however, it's, it's not in Spanish, right? It's all in English still. Yeah, no, it's all in English. And that's one of the things that I've been wrestling with my uh, publisher about uh, because I get so many requests. Uh, hey, Dave, uh, you know, can we get this in Spanish? I live in Mexico and you know, I've, I've, I've shipped uh, books to Mexico um, mm -hmm. because people have written, have reached out to me and said, hey, we, we, I really want to read this book. Um, and, and we're on audible.com. Uh, it's, it's now on Audible. Um, I was getting a lot of requests from veterans uh, and their families who said, Dave, my dad uh, or uncle served in Vietnam he's a Mexican-American or they served in Korea. Uh, they're a little older and they can't read as much anymore. And mm. we really would like to, if this was on Audible. So I kept That's pushing great. my publisher and sure enough, uh, he got it um, and it's now on audible.com. Excellent. That is awesome. I love Audible. <laughs> I know. I got a subscription. I'm addicted to it. <laughs> Um, well, I, I'm from LA, uh, Dave, and I started listening to Audible's 
20 some odd years ago right. or 25 years ago, something like that. Because yeah. on the 405 freeway, you know, you're you're basically in the parking lot. So right. I started to read all the books and, well, uh, hear all the books. And what a great method because but now I'm, I'm accustomed to it in the house. I'm yeah. doing whatever I'm doing. I got my headphones on. I'm listening to a book. And sometimes it's the author and sometimes not. But how you can feel the energy how how when, when they're reading the story to you that's i feel right. like it's just to me <laughs> right so uh the person who narrated the book manuel lara is a cuban uh of descent and he reached out to me he goes hey dave i just want to let you know that i'm i'm narrating the book and i want to give you a couple of snippets of of the book so he sends me the first chapter and oh my goodness uh you know, as a, this is the first book I, I had ever written. And um, to hear someone read out loud something that you put down in a book was like, it gave, it gave me goosebumps uh, to hear for the okay, first man. time, to hear it for the first time. And then Manuel does an excellent job. His accent comes through. Uh, you could almost, you know, there's a couple of things that when, when he sent it to me, I said, uh, you know, we need to we need to change this or this or that because I want it to be authentic for Tejanos. Right, right. Tejanos would never say that word this way, and, and we need to change it to make sure that it it it, it sounds this way. You're so right. Something as simple as an orange. They, you know, we say naranja and they say chino. Yeah. Or China. <laughs> so, and, and I and I and I got to. Uh, wrestle with my editor uh, about this too about this the same subject because there's there's a, a line in, in in the book where i'm describing how my dad would say would talk about going to las vistas and and my editor goes well dave i think we need to change this to el cine i said <laughs> nobody from the san felipe barrio of del rio texas would ever say cine <laughs> <laughs> we need to make sure that we stay with the way uh, Tejanos would 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 talk. And um, True to I'm form. glad I won that fight. <laughs> yeah, good, good for you. You know, we need a glossary for our Tex-Mex or Spanish right, right. words in the back. <laughs> right, and, and that's something. And that's something that I'm going to be doing with uh, Wilmer's people as well. Uh, I'm going to be the lead consultant on the film. So I'll be sitting down with the writers as they come up with the with the different episodes of of, of it. And uh, yeah, that's one of the things that I'm going to be looking at is how are they going to write this? And I want it to come across as authentic as possible. And, and if it <laughs> and if I have to step in and say, hey, we need to change this, <laughs> we need to change that, I'm going to. Uh, and actually, you should. That's, yeah, that's a really good way of thinking. Yeah. Okay. Uh, did I hear right? You said you were writing a second book? Yes. Yes. So actually I'm done with it. I'm going through the editing processing uh, of the book and uh, you'll love this because it's a guy from East LA. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I came across a, a quick little three sentence about a Mexican American who, who served in World War II. He's, he was a pilot. Oh. who flew P-47 fighters. And the guy was, uh, Oscar Perdomo, was born in East L.A. Oh, I'm sorry, he was born in El Paso. His family moved to East L.A. when he was a child. He was very young. So he grew up in, in the Boyle Heights area of East L.A. I went know it very well. Went to Roosevelt High School. I know that uh, very well. He overcame so much to become, I mean, I mean, his family didn't have a lot of money and yet this guy becomes a pilot, an officer in the United States Army during World War II. Wow. He gets assigned to a unit that flies P-47 fighters. They get sent out, this is almost towards the end of the war and they get sent out to the Pacific and he's fly, they're flying out of Lashima, uh, the island out, right off of Okinawa. Two days, before the war ends, there's, I mean, the, the, the Allies had already dropped, the Americans had dropped two atomic bombs on Japan already 
and they had not surrendered. So they're still flying missions. Two days before Japan actually surrenders, he goes up on a mission and they get attacked by enemy fighters. Oscar Perdomo shoots down five enemy planes in one day. Our own Red Baron. Becoming the last American ace in a day of World War II. Wow. And many people don't know his story. So again, using genealogy research, I reached out to his family, found his family, uh, connected with them. They sent me everything about Oscar, his military records, his photos that he had taken with the unit uh, himself. Um, so I started to put together all of his story. I found the roster of the entire uh, squadron, reached out to their families using genealogy research again, because I had names, addresses, sometimes letters that Oscar had written to the family uh, or to, to the, the veteran that, that he had served with. So I had addresses. Wow. Um, so I connected again using genealogy research um, to connect with these families and to be able to tell their entire story. Uh, you you said that he went to Roosevelt? Y yes. He went to Roosevelt High? Yes. You, yes. He, they had, Roosevelt High had a ROTC program there. He might have been um, involved yep. in that. Yeah. Yeah. I, back then, maybe not. Um, uh, I, know, I know Oscar was, uh, was, he was heavily into, into fast cars, <laughs> hot rods. <laughs> yeah, street, street <laughs> the, races. The guy, the way his son it describes him, he always wanted to go with his hair on fire. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how, that's how he became a pilot. Oh, that's Oscar great. had two sons that served in Vietnam also. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and he continued to serve long after World War II um, before retiring from the, he was part of the U.S. Army Air Corps in World War II. And then of course, switched over to the United States Air Force. Wow. When can we can't wait to, to read it? Well, I'm in the editing process right now. I've had to hire another editor um, uh, to be going through the process again. Um, and uh, I don't know, we'll, we'll, we'll see how fast we can get this done. But uh, I'm looking for a publisher um, to get that. Hey, thing Dave? Out. Yes. You know uh, Mimi, Mimi Lozano? Yes. Mimi uh, Lozano published one of the first articles about. Okay, I was just. She, she has so many contacts in the world of, of uh, printing. Um, I'm sure you've already asked her if she knows any editors or people like that that can help help you out. Yeah, yeah. It's a good source. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm doing uh, a lot of research on that too. Good for but you. But Mimi, Mimi was one of the first ones who wrote an, I think she wrote an article before my book was even published. Oh. Excellent, wow. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Mimi Lozano runs the website called SomosPrimos.com. Yes. And I think I think she's still publishing the newsletter. It's a monthly newsletter, email-wise. But you could go and see I come probably 14, 15 years of archives that she has on that website. Right. You know, and you wouldn't even think about it. There I found one of uh, the wills, one of my ancestors in Ayala from Monterrey. So... You never know what you're going to find in, in those newsletters. Right. And uh, Dave, I really want to thank you once again for being with us. Uh, those of you listening to us, make sure and uh, sign up for the conference so you could uh, listen to Dave's presentation about doing military research and over 20 other presenters that, are, that have um, a lot of experience with genealogy. A lot of them are professional genealogists. And we're going to have a lot of methodology classes, how to do certain things uh, in certain areas of the genealogy world. And once again, uh, Wellister, also, thank you for being with us like you've been doing it every month. It was a pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you. And that's it for our podcast. I hope that you enjoyed our conversation. And also, I want to thank Las Vias del Norte once again for sponsoring this uh, show. 
and encourage you to go visit Las Vías del Norte at lasviasdelnorte.com. Remember, Las Vías del Norte provides the same benefits that a genealogical society does, but on a digital platform. They have newsletters, um, monthly video presentations, and a lot of other great stuff. Uh, please go ahead and visit them. And thank you. Until the next time. Thank you for listening to the We Are Cousins podcast, a podcast dedicated to South Texas and Northeastern Mexico genealogy. 